Okay, uh, thank you, James, uh, and good afternoon to everybody at SAS, and um, I'm a dual citizen. I'm actually a Belgian-American. I came over to have been active in the food industry all of my professional career, and over the past European companies, get accustomed to the U.S. food markets, um, introduce and help to make them successful, or give them my advice that I don't see any a potential um, answer to the situation that we face. Um, in May, uh, in, a, in two weeks from now, in Chicago, with one of my principals that I work for. So, presentation. Uh, please note that uh, we can all follow up afterwards in two weeks from now, and assistance and respond to your questions or your observations that you have. Is that um, in 2003 I was um, sent over and their corporation and start selling their product in the market. Um, I did receive asking me similar questions on the various topics that we will cover here today. This market is still the um, land of the promises and the American dream. I decided this model. So um, without any further delay, uh, I'll give the word back to you. Thank you.
Good. Okay, let's go to work. Um, here are a few even private label um, business developments. We all um, know that brand. Sometimes people think that okay, let's uh, enter the market via private label. Easier route to success, but it's just an alternative strategy. So my presentation market because you need to have an understanding of some uh, important elements that play a factor and i will point out some differences uh, related to a private label approach with you some information on the market structure uh, supply chain is one of the most involved i think with business development it's good to be able to sell something but if you can't deliver it the topic that came into the picture about two years ago in 2017 is the food safety program very important new regulation that has a large impact on how pricing of course is another element although pricing is an entry of the market still there are some important uh, elements there to consider as well it's, it's a pretty simple question it's a simple question that i face every day people in europe think that everything in the us is more or less similar as how it happened. do not mistake there's a big difference here what the buyers will expect and how they are we'll um, talk a little bit about that entry barriers um, of the uh, complexities of the market of some of the elements that may interface or some practical barriers that will prevent us from entering this market so, very important, of course, for branded, but as well for private label donor to have a potentially successful outcome. What are my budget requirements? Uh, most forgotten, and it's it's kind of a hidden, forgotten element um, successful here. So um, it's good to face reality before you make your decisions, um, withdraw from your approach to enter the market. Everything leads to based on all these elements that we're going to look into one should come to approach is it private label is it branded plus private label or go through an importer or whatsoever these are all important questions one has to ask them market launch or a pre-market launch at the end of the presentation as may and i will as well um, at the end um, make a few additional notes some really specifically focused on the private label uh, market. All right, that's going to be our um market structure is um here in the us it's a, it's a very complex one. i'm sure um most of you have already visited the us uh, um, a food service outlet or whatsoever and i'm quite sure that you your products are really high here compared to the european prices so most people my product is certainly going to be acceptable on the US market from a price point. It's only very small and the selling price here in the market is maybe perhaps a tenfold. Uh, the complexity of the market, all the various responsibility, uh, you all need them, but every one of them has a certain cost in, in, in pricing between what you would sell for X works from your factory price is here on the US market. Um, 
I'm sure that everybody has heard of a broker. It's like an agent. I'm not sure um, how that works in Estonia on your local market. I know, for instance, in some European countries like Belgium, you don't have brokers or agents. You have your own sales force. Um, but in France, you do have brokers. In Spain, you do have brokers. In Germany, you do have brokers. So it's a bit dependent on the market. But a broker is usually a salesperson that works for multiple companies at the same time. They work on a commission basis, uh, sometimes as well uh, supported by a fixed minimum commission uh, amount per month. Physical distributors are people who are basically not selling your product, but they are used to bring the product from a warehouse up until the retail outlet. A uh, big difference with, with European retailers is that the size of this country is, is, is very large. There's a lot of roads, there's a lot of different channels that need to be uh, worked on before you can actually have your product end up on the shelves. So a, a physical distributor will play a role in there. Um, rag jobbers are then people who are basically uh, picking up the products from the warehouse of the retail outlet and putting them on the shelves. This can be people uh, that are being employed by the retail store, but these can as well be people that are employed by the brokers or by the physical distributors. So all of them have a place in the market, in the market structure, and all of them have a cost. So that's the reason why you see that food prices are usually on the high end compared to European prices uh, at store level. Um, some words over your approach. Uh, one can work through an agent, one can work through an importer, and one can try and sell directly. It all depends on your strategic uh, approach of the market. It all depends on, I would say, what's your long-term objective? Are you going to go to strategically develop the market, or are you more looking for an opportunistic sale, whether it is in the US, whether it is in Canada, or whether it is in another European country. Um, Long-term objective compared to short-term revenue. Do you have an export manager in-house at your location, at your, at your factory? Um, are you going to try and work through an agent, somebody who is representing you countrywide in order to represent your brand, your product, your philosophy? Are you going to, lo to hire local full-time employees? It's another approach to the market. Um, are you going to work with regional brokers? Different approaches that will determine, okay, I will try and sell directly into the US market. I would like to sell through an importer. Importer, as a side note, that seems to be the, um, the easiest approach to work through an importer. But then on the other hand, if you already start with a disadvantage of 30 to 40 percent, that means that if you're looking at the mass market, if you want to sell high volume of your product, most likely your pricing will be out of reach and will be non-competitive. So as an alternative, you can work with an agent who takes a commission and who should be taking care of your local supply chain, your local operational support in order for you to uh, have a chance of success. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Um, as I had mentioned before, supply chain, I find, is one of the most underestimated elements that um, is, is key to your success. Uh, a few points to consider there are, um, are you able, even with private label, to, to do direct shipments from your home country? Or will you need local warehousing? You may think as well there, private label, um, okay, we will ship full container loads directly to the US market to one destination and that's it. It is no longer the case that um, with private label, you can act in such a way. So more and more as well, you would be required to have a local warehouse 
where you can uh, store your products and from there work with a physical distributor to go to the different um, DCs, the different warehouses of the retailer before your product ends up on the shelf. So don't think because you're going for a private label approach that you will overcome this scenario. Um, full container loads as opposed to less than container loads. Okay. Um, I, I realize that for private label, less than container loads is not so common because of the pricing point. But um, everything will be driven as well by your minimum order quantity. How much do you need of one certain reference before you can ship it out as a private label product? That's a question for you. He's going to demand or he's going to let you know if that's too much or too little. Full truck loads uh, compared to less than truck loads. Um, we all wish to be selling in full container loads. We all wish to be shipping in full truck loads, but uh, that's not the reality. So um, as well there, make sure that you are aware what the costs are of less than truck loads in case you are forced to go through a, a regional uh, warehouse or in case you need to store your products from your export department, uh, let's say on a coastal side here somewhere in the East Coast, and then start shipping less than truckloads to the different customers or to the different DCs of one and the same customer. An element that will, of course, play as well an important role in your cost is um, the temperature requirements. Bear in mind that uh, in Europe, in, in, in Central Europe, in some Eastern um, uh, European countries, Temperatures during the summer months may not be as elevated. I mean, um, if I speak for Belgium, maybe 17, 18 degrees Celsius during the summer is an average temperature. That's good. I'm thinking Estonia must be around the same, perhaps a little bit lower. Bear in mind that here on, on the East Coast, in the Southern states, temperatures can rise up to 40, 45 degrees Celsius. So whereas potentially in Europe, you don't need temperature recall, uh, temperature control trucking, you may need it over here. Your dry products, for instance, um, let me look at some of them. Chocolate, of course, you would need temperature controlled. Frozen bakery speaks for itself. Broad soups, sauces, yeah, maybe in Europe, that's okay. But ask yourself the question, what is going to happen to my product shelf life in case the product sits here in a warehouse for three months at 40, 45 degrees Celsius? Is that going to affect the quality of my product? Is that going to affect the shelf life of my product? So um, a different scenario here. Uh, central DCs compared to regional DCs. So as well, uh, based on the fact that this is such a vast and extended um, area to cover from the East Coast to the West Coast, from the North to the South, uh, usually one works with uh, a hub and spoke before we can finally end up in a supermarket on the shelf. That's a little bit about um, supply chain. Okay. Um, in 2017, there was the introduction of the Food Safety Modernization Act, which was stemming from the Obama era. And so one important topic or one important clause within the Food Safety Modernization Act is the Forest Supplier Verification Program. In the past, it was basically the exporter who was responsible for exporting products that were compliant to the uh, local US regulations, food regulations. Um, since 2017, that whole scenario changed. So since 2017, it is now the importer who is responsible of working with uh, safe and um, hygienic and uh, non-hazardous food products from different exporters. So what you see today as a, as a result of that is that a lot of importers they no longer exist because they don't want to deal with that responsibility. But what is more important for private label is that a lot of the U.S. retailers do not want to take on this responsibility. They are telling the exporter, hey, if you want to be present on the U.S. market, if you want me to buy your products, then 
you have to overcome the situation yourself because I don't want to take on the responsibility. It's a whole logbook. It's basically a safety plan that you need to have in place as an importer, declaring that, okay, I'm working with exporter X. Uh, the products that I'm importing are A, B, and C. I've been to the plant. I've done an audit there. They have a food safety plan. They have a recall plan. Uh, there are no uh, official claims that we can find on the web in view of FDA. Um, and so dealing directly with US retailers as an exporter has become more and more complicated. A solution to that scenario, to that situation is to uh, set up your own US subsidiary, your own sales office. So it's very easy to do that here in the US. It's not as complicated as in Europe. There are no minimum capital requirements. So it's, it's usually a good solution but it is as well forcing you to think not so much remember short term term um, revenue opportunity it is more forcing you to think am i going to go to the us if so yes if i want to be there it's going to be a long-term strategic development um pcqi preventive controls qualified individual is a course that i followed as well myself uh, a while ago and so um, in order to um, uh, manage to control this foreign supplier verification program logbook and whatever is involved you need to be either a qualified individual and or have the same qualifications through experience experience means that you know what's happening in the production process environment at a food factory you have the experience to deal with hazardous um, situations to prevent those of course so um, that's as well an, an important additional step as to compare to before 2017. Um, FDA and USDA are conducting factory audits all over the world. This is not just a story. I'm not sure if, if some of you already had the pleasure of receiving FDA auditors, but it's not a threat, it's actually happening. That's what I wanna say there. So, so don't think that you can overcome it. Don't think that you can hide it and, and, and still move forward no there are really um, practical actual audits conducted by fda people um, on a daily basis in europe bear in mind as well that uh, your safety plans should be in english perhaps not a, a problem for your factory for for the country but a lot of these uh, mediterranean countries uh, they only speak their own language and so um, one of the first obstacles that can be presented to FDA. That's something as well to consider there. Next topic, pricing. Um, on the US market, given the complexity, uh, there are different price lists for the same products, but going to different trade channels. Uh, your pricing would be different if you are selling directly to retail as compared to when you were selling through a wholesaler to retail. Your pricing as well would be different if you're selling to food service as compared to retail. Um, your pricing usually is different if you sell through an importer. Um, there I had mentioned before that uh, you may price yourself out of the market, so be aware of that. Be aware of well when you issue a price list, when you hand over a price to a um, retailer, to a buyer, or whatever it is that you decide to, to go after. Um, there are commissions involved for brokers. There are marketing costs. There are deductions. Deductions are something um, typically for the US markets. I think we see them less in Europe. Deduction would be I sell for 100 to my customer and my customer is only going to pay me 97 because now all of a sudden there was a dent in one of the cases, uh, a label was not correctly applied, all kinds of penalties because I didn't deliver my product at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, but I was there at 2.30, my trucker was there at 2.30. So be aware before you hand over a price what could be involved, which elements you need to take care of. Um, Another very important one, uh, as well applicable to private label, is if you were private labeling for a seasonal item in the food industry, you would have um, a ruling that says uh, 
let's let's take for instance um, Valentine's Day. You're in the chocolate industry. You're selling um, chocolate hearts in a nice Valentine's packaging. Your um, buyer from your uh, store may tell you whatever product you did not sell me by February 10th, so four days before uh, Valentine's Day, I will deduct 15% of your price that I'm paying you. Whatever product that we haven't sold on February 14th, I will deduct 30%. And for instance, whatever product is still in my store on February 15th, I'm only paying 25%. So bear in mind, ask questions when you're in such a situation. Uh, make sure that you understand what will be coming your way. Slotting fees are usually as well something that is applicable more on the branded side of the business. That means that you're actually buying space on the shelf in the freezer. It's more applicable on um, uh, freezer space. So uh, let me see here. What else do we have? We have frozen bakery products. That's more in the in-store bakery. So that's a different scenario. But uh, asking of you to pay us a thousand dollars per store that you want to be in. If you have the chance of being in, in um, a Publix retail chain, they have 1,400 stores. I mean, can you support that? Is that something that you can do? So ask questions. As well, one would think slotting fees is only um, applicable to branded products. But we see as well that for private label, more and more people are asking for slotting fees, but then disguised under a, a separate uh, nomination. They call it um, um, art renewal fees, or they call it, okay, we have to uh, make sure that the one who was taking the shelf before you needs to be removed from there. So this is going to cost you. So don't necessarily think because you're into private label that you are going to avoid all of these costs. Good, that's that. Um, Expectations of the buyer. I, I mostly struggle with the fact that the principals that I work for, the exporters that I work for, they underestimate the uh, required response time. Um, I know every, every country has its culture and every culture has a different scenario there. Um, basically, it comes down in the US like this. If you receive a question, it would be good if you could answer within 24 hours maximum 48 hours if you cannot answer within 48 hours then at least tell the people okay i need more time you are going to have my response before the end of this week very important one um I've, i'm going at this moment through a setup with uh, whole foods for instance uh, with with some uh, breakfast cereals Questions on, on, on ingredients, questions on safety, um, questions on changing of some ingredients, changing of the recipe. Um, they are daily, I would say. They have a whole team of people. So if you are short on resources, if your quality department is already stretched, it might be following the expectations of the buyer. So um, be aware of that. Another aspect which is uh, applicable on the US market and not so much in Europe is a product liability insurance. Usually you need to have insurance, um, I would say up to $5 million, sometimes $10 million. I know if you contract this insurance out of Europe, it's gonna cost you uh, an arm and a leg, usually five, six, 7,000 euros per year to, as a, for a startup company. This is one of the advantages if you have your US subsidiary your product liability insurance costs will go down to about $1,200 for a startup year, $1,500. So that's a big advantage there. Um, additional to your, if you have um, IFS, if you have BRC, if you have ISO certificates, usually if you deal with larger buyers, uh, larger retail chains, I'm sorry, they will still insist on having an additional third party factory audit. So be aware of that. I wanted to add this slide just to give you an understanding. This is a questionnaire that I received from my uh, one of the brokers that I work with, 
who is going to do a company introduction to Albertsons. Albertsons Safeway is one of the larger retailers here in the US. And so she was given the opportunity to make a presentation at headquarter level of the buyer of the product category. And so these are all the different points that she needed to address as a first introduction. So when you go to the PLMA, make something up for yourself so that you already have this information. Uh, you can use it for multiple prospects, multiple accounts, and um, just, just prepare yourself. I'm not going to go into detail on all of these elements. I think they speak for themselves. And I believe as well that this presentation will be shared afterwards. And if you still have a couple of um, free hours before you uh, take on your travels to Chicago, make sure that you, you have that information with you. Entry barriers. Uh, I think um, by way of, of making this presentation, I already uh, had mentioned a few entry barriers. Um, James as well had mentioned something on the meat. So, um, we have, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking here. Can you also see that I take back my seasonal products? Okay, I, I, will, um, I will address, sorry, I was looking at the chat box now. So I will address all these questions uh, at the end of the session. Sorry. Um, for meat, it's called the equivalent status. So on a national level, on, on a level between the two states, so the United States on a level with the government of Estonia, um, needs to have an understanding that the practices in place allow for meat from Estonia to be exported to the U.S. market. So today that is not a fact. So um, the answer to your question, am I ready for the U.S. market in this scenario? Uh, you may be ready, but the states do not allow for it. So that's, that's um, a negative impact, I would say, on your potential uh, export market here. We have the same thing with uh, produce permissibility. So for instance, um, I managed a produce company a couple of years ago and um, it was possible to export leaks from Belgium to the US, but it was not possible to export the same leaks from the Netherlands to the US. And then vice versa, Brussels sprouts from uh, the Netherlands were allowed and not from Belgium. So there as well, it's, it's, it's a political thing. Uh, it's market protection. It's um, favorism but it is what it is so make sure to check on the equivalent status and on the permissibility of your products before you start investing uh, more money into potential market launch some items require an import license uh, could be uh, for instance frozen uh, herbs and vegetables i had a situation a few years ago um, FDA, USDA, they describe what ingredients are allowed, which ones are not, how your packaging need to be formatted. Um, you need to have a registered FDA agent on site in the US who can be approached 24 seven. So these are all potential entry barriers for you. Um, a more natural entry barrier may be import taxes. We know these days with uh, the Trump administration and whatever they're trying to accomplish. Um, there are a lot of questions about taxation of European food import products, of European food products. So there as well, make sure that um, you are aware of what's happening and, and, and make sure that that is part of your pricing calculation. An entry barrier could just be that you are competing with a local manufacturer who has the same or similar product, but um, given the fact that he's local, that he can avoid already lots of supply chain uh, costs, given the fact that they may already have distribution in place, that might mean that uh, it's a big obstacle for you to overcome in order to have a chance of being successful here on the market. Of course, direct and indirect competing products, um, not always direct uh, competing products, uh, indirectly as well. It can be that the U.S. market is, for instance, not accustomed to um, marzipan. In Europe, we always like marzipan. We know our marzipan, but in the U.S., it's not a, a, a directly competing product because it just doesn't exist here or, or there's no big appetite for that. Your exchange rate, of course, can be an uh, entry barrier. 
uh, depending on which way it, it swings. Uh, just make sure that you are aware for yourself how much percentages in change that you can tolerate within the given price range. Usually you have to commit to a pricing for 12 months. It's the same in Europe, but here there's the exchange rate that is an additional element there. Uh, money collection. You may think for private label, okay, I'm just going to ship my product from Estonia directly to the US and I'm going to receive my money. A lot of these retailers, a lot of these importers, they just want to pay by check. They want to send a check in US dollars to a US address. Can you handle that? There are exceptions. There are some customers um, not in the capability. A lot of them um, refuse to do so even. Time zone can be an entry barrier on communication. Um, for Europe, it's easier to start on the East Coast rather than to start exploring on the West Coast. But then again, if your first customer or your first potential customer is on the West Coast, you may have to talk uh, internally and, and make sure that some people are uh, staying a bit later in the office to make sure that they can have the communication with everybody over there. Culture is, is, um, is a big one, is, is a natural one. Um, so many differences I still notice on a daily basis um, and, and, and that's the reason why I think that um, a company like mine can make a difference because I understand the cultures are on, on both sides. It's not that one is bad and one is better, far from, it's just what you understand in your situation, what is being said and how do you understand it and, and what you take as action that is satisfying the other party. Sometimes shelf life can be an entry barrier. If we're working with um, short shelf life product, uh, bear in mind at least 12 months is needed in order to have a distribution that is acceptable. Some distributors, some importers will not accept shelf life with less than two thirds of the remaining shelf life on there. Uh, you have to answer the question if that makes your product um, more difficult to export or not. Kosher is as well very um, prevalent uh, and, and uh, required in the market, especially on the East Coast, New York metropolitan area. Uh, you need to have a kosher certificate in order even to sell to larger uh, club stores like a BJ's or, or um, uh, Costco. It's, it's really uh, important to have those. The uh, HACCP plan, the safety plan, and the QA certificates we covered, um, it's important to have one. I think it speaks for itself, but but still, um, some people think that um, they can get away with that one. I wouldn't recommend it, and most likely your first uh, discussion will end pretty quickly. FISMA and FSVP we already covered. Um, a little bit about marketing. I think in Europe, we're good at making a product, but we're not as good at selling a concept. In the US, it's not only about the product, it is as well about the packaging, it's as well about the history, the little story that you tell in your packaging, it's about the display, how do you position it. It's more a total concept. So um, if you are good at that, then certainly use it. Uh, I see too many exporters from Europe who are coming over here with the attitude, I make a perfect product, everybody's going to buy it, I don't care about the packaging, I don't care about the story, they need to buy it like this. It's not going to happen here. Promotions, um, even private label products, uh, buyers may uh, require about promotions. It can be that they say, we're going to do an intro promotion. We're going to launch you a new private label product. But the first three months, I want to give 15% off. Make sure that you know this information. Make sure that it's part of your pricing because you're not going to receive 100, but you're going to receive 85 only. Slotting fees we covered. Um, trade shows, yes. I think it's a good first step if you're going to participate at a trade show. The country is so large, the distances are so large that um, this is really a venue to come all together and to, to network and to exhibit and to attend and to talk and to, I think, not only just exhibit, but as well go to the networking events, go to the receptions, go to potentially the presentations that they're giving there just to get a better understanding of the market and to try and connect with your peers in the market. They will give you 
advice. Um, Americans are, are really generous when it comes down to sharing information to help uh, foreign people to, to, to become successful. That's, that's my experience. Um, sales team, brokers training, yeah, maybe not so much for private label, but, but still, um, I think it's not different in, in, in Europe, but uh, don't forget about it. Um, there's a lot of talk here. The sales teams are expensive to have. Brokers travel quite a bit, may have multiple lines. So make sure that you're still on top of their minds. Send them a thank you note, a follow up, buy them a beer, buy them lunch. It doesn't have to be all this official and, and, and this much. Uh, it shouldn't cost that much, but um, yeah. Be kind and make sure that you're on the top of their mind um, when they go out on a daily basis. So many samples shipped to all of these different people that may or may not be involved just to try and convince them, okay, this is the right product. Uh, some of my principals have the idea, yeah, I will send samples, but they have to pay for the uh, FedEx charges, for the TNT charges. Please don't ask. Uh, for your potential customer to pay for the uh, delivery charges. It's not going to make them happy. Um, advertising, editorial news, it's not much different than in Europe. Um, I would say just, just make sure that you don't forget about it. Even with private label, they have their own channels to uh, promote your products, of course. Let's see, um, budget requirements. Uh, trade shows usually are less expensive than in Europe, I would say. Um, private label may be an exception in this scenario. Uh, it all depends as well what you need. Um, do you require uh, a freezer to be part of your booth? Then once the labor starts kicking in and you have to deal with the unions here, it may become expensive, but just going to a fancy food show in New York or San Francisco is going to cost you four or five thousand um, dollars. Do a few a year. I would say when you launch a product, do a minimum of two, preferably three or four a year. Later on, you can adjust. Product liability insurance we covered. Marketing promotions as well. Um, travel. Yeah, it, it's if you have brokers going out. Um, these guys cost money. If you have your own salespeople on the road, it costs money to travel in the US. Um, so don't forget to um, take that into consideration when you are um, releasing your budget for your uh, US market approach. US subsidiary, setting up your US subsidiary, as I mentioned, is not so expensive. Um, thousand, two thousand dollars for uh, corporate governance fees, uh, filing fees, and a lawyer to do that. Uh, maybe a few hundred dollars for a PO box or something like that. Uh, if you require somebody to manage it, to be on your board, of course, there will be uh, some expenses related to that. Um, if you have any specific questions on this topic, I can respond to you uh, more on a privately basis. Strategic market approach. Okay, um, important questions. Do we have sufficient resources, not only dollars, but as well personnel? Do I have the personnel to follow up on all these questions, to send out these samples, to travel to the US market to exhibit? Um, if you don't, probably better um, to, to have a different approach to go after a different market. What am I going to do? Do I go after retail, food service, e-commerce? Am I going to go with my recipe and do local contract manufacturing? Am I going to go after the industrial industry? If I have an ingredient, that could be a better uh, opportunity. So uh, things to consider, not only for the US market, I know this is very general, but um, still make sure that you answer these questions for yourself before you decide to invest money into this market. Branded private label, okay, this is um, the whole um, presentation here. Concept product we uh, covered. How are we going to uh, an agent, to an importer? Are we going to go direct? I see that my conclusion there just dropped off the, uh, the slide there. Uh, go, no go. Um, I would say for the market reviews that I do for my customers, more than 50% of the time my conclusion is this is nothing for you. This is nothing for you because one of these reasons, you may not have sufficient resources, you may not have sufficient money, 
maybe that uh, you need to change out an ingredient which is going to be too costly for you to cover. Maybe you don't have sufficient time to go to these trade shows. Maybe you think that importer is the easiest, but then you have expectations and volume of sales which are not matching up. So just be realistic. And um, sometimes it's better to say no than to still insist but not succeed. Okay, a little bit information on Across Foods. Um, my company provides four kinds of services, I would like to call it, uh, market intelligence. I assist companies in, in gaining better understanding of the US market, as I'm doing to you for now at this moment. Um, I do business development as a sales agent. I provide back office operations, dealing mainly with supply chain, um, some administration, and then uh, whatever concerns FSVP and being the FDA agent. And then my company as well is involved with um, incorporations of US subsidiary and the management of that. So. Um, if you have any questions, if you think you require more in-depth uh, assistance, feel free to contact me directly. You have my coordinates there. And um, I see I took on a lot of time already. So um, rather than just adding a few points, perhaps it's better to go to the, um, to the question, James. What do you think? I think in theory one would um, one could bring up that question and in theory I think it would be possible now bear in mind that your supply chain costs your logistics costs for collecting all these items from all these different retail stores and bringing them back to your warehouse is going to be more costly than just giving them the deduction that's what they're counting on basically so it's a dual response. Yes, it is possible in theory, but practically nobody does that. I would think at least 99%, if not 100% would expect you to, you have to act like a local company. So USD is the currency here. Um, it would be an additional entry barrier in case you are trying to convince your, your buyer to uh, buy product in euros or whatever currency. Of course. Yeah, of course, there are the, the hedging principles or, or um, future buying of um, a currency. So that's more a financial question. I know that it is possible, but I'm not the expert to respond to that question and I'm not providing those services myself.
if, if not, there's a few more points that I can make, James, just uh, related to private label. Perhaps I'll continue in that way. Uh, just so um, if you are sitting uh, together with a buyer and you're talking about private label, don't forget to ask about who is responsible for the cost of the development of the artwork. Is the buyer, is the retail chain going to send you an invoice afterwards for um, developing private label, which you think like, well, it's, it's private label. I have nothing to do with that. Just make sure that you understand how that process works because it can be that they will send you an invoice for their uh, costs of, of putting up the nutrition deck on there or for even developing the, the, the design themselves. Some companies, some retail chains have as well the, um, uh, the, the common way of handling to say each year you need to um, add $2,000 for upgrading of the artwork make sure that that's part of your pricing so don't be afraid to ask questions uh, another point is payment terms um, some companies will demand that they can deduct two percent when they pay within seven or eight days it's good that they will pay within seven or eight days but are you aware that they will deduct two percent or not what is going to happen to uh, inventory to packaging inventory that hasn't been sold in case they would like to move on in case they would like to upgrade their design. Make sure to ask that question. Is it going to be your cost or is it going to be their cost? Um, as well, lead times is very critical because we're shipping from Europe. So what are their expectations? Can they deal with eight weeks of lead time or do we need to set up a local warehouse and have some kind of a buffer inventory in between? Not only to cover for shorter lead times, but as well to cover eventually for uh, let's say a container gets holed up at, at uh, U.S. Customs or there's something wrong with the freight for water and, and the vessel that is carrying your container. Uh, make sure that that is an open uh, topic as well to communicate on. Those were a few extra points, James. Thank you. Yeah, well, that, that's why I wanted to enter to include that slide as well with all these different topics that we had to prepare for when we were going to make a, a presentation at a buyer. So make sure that you already have answers to that, that you already can tell that story so that you have less of these general questions to ask. Asking questions as such is good. It, it tells them, it, it shows everybody that you are thinking of, of what next steps could be. You are thinking of what potential hazards can be. You are thinking of potential barriers. Uh, so asking questions is good. Um, asking too many questions, I think it will become pretty obvious that the buyer is no longer amused with additional questions. And then it's just a matter of uh, being quiet for a while. If, if you're still missing critical information at that moment, I would say that means that the buyer may not be that interested than you thought he would be interested. And don't be don't don't, don't be um, uh, negatively uh, minded in case you don't receive any answers. That's just the way buyers they receive so many questions. There are so many people that want to present their products. In case you don't hear from them, don't think that it's impolite or don't think that they don't like you. No, it's just a matter of them telling you this is not the right moment. But the right moment now may not be the right moment anytime. It might be that six months from now, the situation changes. As well as, well as, as I would say as a last point of advice for the people who are going to the trade show, um, usually in Europe, we just stand back and we wait until we receive a question. Um, the US, it's completely different. Be interactive with the people who are visiting you. Um, don't ask, can I help you? Or do you have any questions? 
No, if you see somebody looking, already start telling your story. Oh, this is an organic uh, piece of chocolate, or this is a very specific sauce. It's made with these and these ingredients. And I think I see that there's an opportunity in this category. Just start conversating with them that way. And then everything else will become much more um, easily to, to, to get an understanding of the real interest, I would say. That's my last piece of advice.